Hey everyone, this is CJ from CJ's Coins and Crafts, and welcome to Numiscast. This program is dedicated to exploring, learning, and understanding our coinage. Today we will be talking about the minting process, specifically all about how the coins are made. In part one, we covered the minting process, specifically looking at the dies and how they are made. We covered the hubbing process to create the generations of dies from the master hub all the way down to the working die. We also explored some of the equipment used and how the process of creating dies has changed over time. Now we are going to use this information to look at how coins are struck by these dies, but first we need to know how the coin is made. The process of making a coin has a number of steps. Number one, metals are smelted down and poured into ingots. Number two, those ingots are then rolled out to create thin strips of metal. Number three, these strips of metals are put through the blanking machines to create the coin blanks. Number four, these coin blanks go through the upsetting mill to get a rim. Number five, after the upset mill, the coins are put into the coining presses where the coin is struck. And last, number six, the coin is then ejected into a bin and then moved to the large storage bags. <clears throat> Up through the 40s, the mint would smelt these metals in the appropriate alloy mixes to pour into forms, which is casting them into ingots. The metals would come from the raw materials being mined across the United States, as well as recycled materials from other sources, like coins that are no longer machinable or byproducts from other minting processes. These ingots were then rolled out between two hardened steel rollers that create flat strips of metal that could be rolled up and later utilized on the blanking presses. A blanking press takes the strip of metal off the roll, flattens it, and punches out round discs of the appropriate diameter for the coin being produced. The blanks are screened through a riddler machine which separates the correctly sized blanks and any form material that has been mixed in during the blanking process. The modernized version of this process has the mint purchasing wide spools of the metal, roughly 13 inches wide and up to 1,500 feet long. The spools of metal strip are then fed into the blanking presses. The mint creates the blanks for nickels, dimes, quarters, half dollars, and dollars using these methods. Exceptions to this process are the blanks for the cent, or penny, bullion coin, and numismatic coins. The blanks for these, which are purchased from a third-party manufacturer. The waste from the blanking process presses is called webbing, and is generally shredded and recycled. The blanks are sent to an annealing furnace to prepare them for striking. Annealing is a process that heats up the blanks to temps up to 1600 degrees Fahrenheit. This furnace has an oxygen-free environment to prevent the blanks from tarnishing. Once the coins are heated up, they are then quenched into a mixture of water, citric acid powder, and lubricants. The blanks are removed from the quench tank in different methods, depending on the mint facility. At the Philadelphia Mint, they use a machine called a Whirl Away that slowly turns as it lifts the blanks out of the quench tank. And the Denver Mint uses a large scoop called a Skip Basket. The blanks, fresh from the quench tank, are washed and dried before being sent on the next phase of production, which is the upset mill or the upsetting mill. This process feeds the blanks into a small groove which is slightly narrower than the diameter of the blank. This pressure pushes the metal up around the edge to form the rim. This rim design protects the final coin from wear and allows it to stack with others of the same type of coin. Once the blank receives this rim, 
then it is called a planchet. Most of the blanks that the mint buys are planchets ready for striking. When the mint receives a shipment of planchets, they are carefully checked to ensure they meet the required specifications. If the planchets pass the quality checks, they will go directly to the presses for striking. Special proof and uncirculated planchets go through a separate cleaning process called burnishing. These planchets are placed into a drum with cleaning agents and small pellets to smooth and polish the surface. After burnishing, they are rinsed a second time and hand dried. The planchets are ready for the coining presses. They are fed into the coining presses with chutes and large bins. The presses place the planchet into the striking chamber, which is a space between the two dies, the obverse and reverse, and a collar. When the two opposing dies come together pressing into the planchet, the outward pressure is retained by the collar, which pushes the metal from the planchet into the die faces to create the design. For most coinage, the collar is flat, but for some coins, like the dime, the quarter, the half dollar, the collar has ridges in it, which helps create the reeded edge of the coin. Dollar coins receive a smooth edge and are then put through an additional machi machine that rolls the lettering onto the edge. Once the planchet has the design, it becomes a coin. A note about the rolling of the letters onto the edge of the dollar coins. There is, these are generally considered as A or B style lettering. And all of that is, is it depends on which side is facing up when you're looking at the bust side of the coin. References can be found online, um, but they are generally half and half. So there isn't one style that is more prevalent than the, than the other style. They are mixed pretty well. Um, different presses, uh, different pressures are used depending on what type of coin is being produced. For regular circulating coinage, the presses use between 35 and 100 metric tons of pressure depending on the, on the denomination. Presses for creating the circulating coinage can strike the coins at a rate of several hundred per minute. These presses are designed to strike coins that are used for circulation. They are not designed to be used for, for looks. So even for brand new coins that are, that are freshly struck, um, you can still have a lot of dye deterioration uh, and effects on the coin um, because these, these pr presses for circulating coinage are only made to, uh, to create as many as possible. To create the America the Beautiful 5-ounce silver coins, a press will exert up to 540 tons of force, which is a lot. Circulating, uncirculated, and bullion coins are struck a single time, while proof coins, which are fed manually into a coining press, and are struck at least twice. Once the coins are struck, they drop into a bin or tray, where they will be spot-checked for errors. If any errors are found, they are rejected and sent to a machine called a waffler. The waffler will bend the coins before they are sent to be recycled. The coins that pass the inspection process are packed into bulk storage bags and shipped to the 28 branches of the Federal Reserve Bank, as well as more than 100 private sector coin terminals. These terminals are operated by the armored carriers like Brinks, Loomis, and Garda. These private sector companies often have contracts with the local banks to provide them with coin orders. So the Mint will ship these large bags. Um, generally, they're in the ballpark of about $26,000 um, in these large bags, and they will be sent to these private coin 
private sector coin terminals. And that's where the companies like Brinks, Loomis, and Garda will then roll that coin um, into rolls. And then that coin will go to the banks that, uh, or banks and or credit unions um, that that people can get uh, can get coinage from. Uh, so that's where um, this stuff comes in. Even if it comes directly from the the Federal Reserve banks, um, there's still an opportunity that some of the coinage, depending on how it's mixed uh, with other circulating coinage, that um, these uh, these private companies get. Um, how you can have brand new coin and old coin um, mixed in together. So this is kind of a short, uh, a shorter piece on how the physical coins are made. There's going to be a lot of different things that uh, I'm going to be talking about in the next in the next couple of shows when we're talking about errors and we're talking about varieties. Uh, I'm going to go into a lot of detail on how those um, those errors and varieties are made and what to look for. Um, so look out for those. I hope you enjoyed uh, and uh, enjoyed this episode, and this helped increase your knowledge uh, about how the minting process works. I feel like everybody should know and learn the minting process because it will it will greatly greatly help you uh, when looking at coins because then you can, it helps you understand what you are seeing on coins and how you can explain what you are seeing by using the minting process. Thanks uh, for joining me today and covering the minting process part two coins. I hope to see you on the next one.